Welcome to Epilogue Podcast, the show where we discuss some stuff that happened on a different show ages ago which nobody really cares about anymore. Hello, I'm Port Ponky. And I'm LeBlanc. Today we are discussing Deep Space Nine, Season 3, Episode 1, The Search, Part 1. Using a new prototype fighter ship, the Defiant, Cisco and the Deep Space Nine crew enter the Gamma Quadrant to find the Founders. After some investigation, they get overwhelmed by Jem Hadar forces, and Odo and Kira escape to the Imarian Nebula, where Odo reunites with his people. That's one heck of a cliffhanger. Yeah. So, a a lot happened then. Lots of stuff happening, and lots of tiny changes to stuff that we've become familiar with. Yeah, I think more happened in this episode than in the entire season one. (laughs) Uh, That sounds about right. So, you've not seen this before, what were your thoughts? I liked it. Uh, It's it's a little weird. Um, The crew is all out and about. They're on a ship. That's not what this crew does. So, it was a little strange. A nice change of pace, but I thought it was a weird choice uh, for a season opener. Um... But then I thought it's not the obligation of the season to reestablish everything always. If someone sees this episode as their first Deep Space Nine episode, they can investigate and watch prior episodes if they want to. So they're free to do whatever, and they did. It was just a little strange, but I liked it. Nice change of pace. Um throwing me off right away as we launch into season three how did you feel uh upon revisiting this i oh i like this one i like the next one the the concluding part there's more twists and turns to come uh obviously uh i liked it i knew this would be quite a surprising one because it's a seven seasons show and we're not even we're not even halfway through, so it's a real curveball that Odo finds his people. You expect that to happen at the end, or not at all, you know? Yeah, we have the knowledge of how long this show uh, aired, so to see this storyline already uh, is surprising. But even if you didn't know, you know it's the first episode of the season, so... You'd expect that at the end of a season, maybe. It's odd where it's placed, which is good because it's kind of a surprise. Well, it's kind of predictable once he starts uh, going off on one about the Marian Nebula. You kind of think, oh, he's onto something. Yeah, he has a gut feeling, despite not having a gut. Well, he can have as much guts as he wants. Uh, yeah, that's true. He could enhance his gut feelings by shape shifting into several of them. Well, yeah, he doesn't have to be just like a solid uh, mass that's completely consistent. He could just be a big bag of guts. Or he could have hollow spaces inside himself to store objects. I don't know how he resists just doing strange things I know. like that. Well, maybe the novelty has worn off. All oh, right, he said he doesn't like to draw attention to it. But, guy, you would though, wouldn't you? I mean, I, okay. An example in this episode, he's uh, he's got to go potty. <laughs> By which I mean, he's got to liquefy into his bucket, and he's raging at Quark because he's angry about needing to go so bad and he does a a, a speech just stay out of my way stay out of my way he could have just morphed his entire head into a giant middle finger (laughs) flipping quark off 
or whatever the Star Trek equivalent of that is, morph his head into a big <laughs> poster, big billboard with a picture of a cork, and you suck written next to it. Odo isn't one for subtlety. There's nothing subtle about that. It's just dissing people in a way that they can't even begin to respond to. But yeah, I guess that would be incredibly puerile. I think if people really did have shape-shifting powers, uh, they would go crazy with them. It would be nice if when his emotions go wild, he couldn't control certain aspects of his shape-shifting. Uh, for example, during that scene when he's yelling at Quark, if he unconsciously made himself taller and started to tower over Quark or something like that, how his emotions just surge through him and shapeshift without his explicit knowing. That would actually be cool. I feel that would work better in animation rather than live action. Yeah, it's not very practical. Um it probably wouldn't even look very good given the constraints of where CGI was at the time. Yeah, the changing effect looks nice, but it's clunky and slow, so subtle changes are never going to look that good. They do enough with him that it's interesting. Yeah, they they keep it interesting. I get the feeling that they're aware, yeah, he could do so much more, but we have a budget... And we can't just go wild with this guy. Yeah, every time he shapeshifts, you think, okay, he's not going to do that again for three or four <laughs> episodes. Well, yeah. I say that, there's not just Odo anymore. There's oh, right. four or five of them at the end. We have a uh, sort of feminine Odo telling us welcome home. Yeah, oh, I said it was four or five. There was a massive big lake of, of uh, goop. I really liked that they took on Odo's shape. It just makes sense. Yeah. What is what like what is their identity? Goop. What, yeah, goop, I guess, because that's what they were, big like a goop. But then why does Odo have so much shame about it? Uh because he was brought up in a lab. Okay. I guess. He's just shy and he's a baby. He's been in a lab and around people, so he's experienced extreme prejudice. Uh, well, yeah. Bajorans get the pitchforks out at a moment's notice. Whereas his brethren are happy to just be goop in a lake. So other than Odo's big adventure, there was a decent amount of investigation and space action going on. We had the uh, the good sort of dust boot feeling where they were hiding under the cloak. That was cool. I liked when they didn't even know the, uh, whether the scan would pick them up. Yeah, it's really tense. I, it makes you wish that they'd used cloaks before on Star Trek because the Federation aren't allowed cloaks. Um because it makes things too exciting slash easy. <laughs> Which is why they had the Romulan there to be in charge of the cloaking device. Wait, do they have some sort of honor code that they can't use cloaking? I, it, They don't have the tech. Uh, they don't know how to make them, I think. And I, they are seen... I don't know if they're banned or they're seen as dishonest or like a a weapon almost that's contrary to the good actions of the Federation. So it's like a Geneva Convention thing? I think so. Um, my knowledge is failing me. I can't remember what exactly the reason is or if it's ever been stated. But yeah, the Federation don't, don't have them. Okay, let's clear this up. The Federation have had access to captured cloaking technology on numerous occasions, but they agreed to outlaw them when signing the Treaty of Algernon with the Romulan Empire, because they are the good guys and good guys are not sneaky. So this is the first time that Federation guys have been going out cloaking. Well, probably not. I mean, there's episodes here and there where they've mucked about with them. 
tangentially, but this is the first time they've had one of their own to play with and use. And it's exciting! But why is it this crew playing with it? Uh, well, they wanted to know if it would hide from the Jem'Hadar. But, I mean, uh, why not get a crew that is used to flying a ship and not one that's on a station? The, um, that's a good question. I guess this crew is the most familiar with the Gamma Quadrant. But, yes, realistically, the ship would have had a mix of experienced pilots and stuff and Deep Space Nine uh, people in a diplomatic uh, role. I mean, if you want the real answer, it's because they're the main characters. <laughs> yeah. This episode brought up an issue that I never considered, but it's important, and that's uh, that Odo should be questioned in his position. Uh, what do you mean? They should either have a Federation officer or a Bajoran person. Not some shapeshifter. That's kind of weird. Uh, Odo is a member of the Bajoran uh, military. Or something. He wears the same sort of uniform as Kira, so I assume he's part of the same organization. Yeah, but I guess I'll lean on the first thing. They should have a Federation officer. Uh, yeah, it's odd that he just seems to have ended up in that role, and... They never really wanted to replace him. Or, well, they had that guy in season one, Primin, who lasted two episodes before just vanishing off the face of the earth, so Odo will probably flush him out in airlock. It does create this nice background narrative, though, where the Federation wanted to get rid of Odo and Cisco fought for him, and that's why he's still there. Odo's a good detective. He's good at solving cases, which is... Uh, where he's got a natural predisposition to it. He's got an amazing memory. He's very cold and calculating and also able to shapeshift, which is extremely valuable when investigating. He's used it countless times to do silly stuff. Well, probably not countless. About four times, <laughs> I would guess. Uh, that's Yeah, you can count that. It is possible to count that, yes. He's adept at his job, but he doesn't always honor the chain of command or privacy. Yeah, he... When you say he doesn't always honor the chain of command, he doesn't at all care <laughs> about it, even in the slightest. He just does what he does to get things running the way he likes, which happens to be uh, kind of nice, I guess. Likes locking up the bad guys. I've always given him a pass because I like Odo so much, but I like even more that the show addressed this. Yeah, he got um, Eddington in to annoy Odo slash replace Odo slash be a character who's there for a few episodes to antagonize Odo. I guess we'll find out which one of those it is. Uh, I have a, a criticism. Let's hear it. It's a, the classic Star Trek criticism, the number one thing that Star Trek is always criticized for, and there's a really blatant example of it in this episode, when they're cruising about on the Defiant and the Jem'Hadar start pot-shotting them, and, you know, all the keywords start exploding. Yeah. A guy in a red shirt, who we've never seen before, <laughs> falls down dead. And, yeah, they killed the red shirt to show that the situation was serious. So, yeah, I guess that's my <laughs> criticism is they shouldn't do that, but they do. That trend is so prominent. I was aware of it before ever watching anything Star Trek related. Deep Space Nine is the least bad for it, although, as you can see, it creeps in now and again. It, in original series and next gen, it happens kind of frequently. I was actually confused when we started watching. I expected to see red shirts dying left and right. Yeah, they've killed a few. This isn't the first time it's happened. There was an engineer that got melted in the duct 
in the last episode of season one who had no backstory. He's just like, oh, that guy's melted. Oh, well. He had no backstory, and then they didn't even care after he was melted. Yeah. I actually laughed in this one when Bashir took the red shirt's pulse for like a second <laughs> and said, he's gone. Uh, because even if his heart had completely stopped, it's he's only been on the floor for like three seconds. It's absolutely possible to fix him. I mean, all you could tell is that he's got a weak or non-existent pulse, but he's just fallen over. His heart could start beating again like three seconds later. Uh, the art of pulse taking advanced. Uh, well, actually what I think it was was Bashir looked at him when Red shirt, yep. No pulse, no hope. Fatal condition, red shirt. If only he'd worn a blue or yellow shirt. Then maybe I could have defibrillated him or taken him to med bay or something. But clearly, this is a lost cause. This was the first chance for them to do a big amount of shaky vision as well. And they went wild. They really did. Uh, Bashir looked like he was sitting on a washing machine. <laughs> it's like he was just writhing around all over the place. Yeah, it really sticks out because up until this point, this show has been mostly stationary with its camera and we have clear scenes of action. And then here they just went wild with the camera. Yeah, uh, well, they've got it all pent up. Yeah, they had to. Uh, Unleash. I think it's also the way it's shot is different. I don't know if this was obvious. The lenses are different from now on. It's shot with telephoto lenses instead of wide lenses. So everything seems more closer and uh, personal. Ah, okay. I felt like the lighting was different, but maybe that's a result of the changing lenses. It might be. I'm not sure. They probably redo the lighting rigs every season. Okay, what do you think is going to happen next time, then? I don't know. I didn't think about it. I've gotten to the point with this show where I like what the writers are doing, and I don't want to speculate too much, and I just want to enjoy what they're showing me. Um, oh, some of your speculation is very, very hilarious. <laughs> Uh, well, I did have one thing where I thought it would be funny if Odo's ancestors did not resemble him at all as far as um, his liking, his love for justice. Oh, like he meets them and they're just uh, like happy, clappy, hippie commune. Yeah, they're just carefree and loose and he doesn't understand. Uh, that would be very funny, actually. And then he's just completely disgusted with them and storms off. Yeah, because you assume they're all going to be the same, but I guess that's a bit prejudice. Who knows? They're, they should all be individuals just like people. How could you not have your own buckets? <laughs> no, man, we just go in the lake when we need to go. Just go in the lake, man. We're all together. This is disgusting. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Taking my bucket and going home. But I'm going to guess the writers did something more profound. Uh, no, you're dead on. In fact, the next change then that comes out is uh, played by Owen Wilson. <laughs> like, oh, far out. Wow, no kidding. <laughs> Oh, there's a YouTube clip of every time he says wow, isn't there? Yeah, it's a great compilation. Wow! All you need to do for uh, an impression of him is to say wow. Wow! Perfect. You could do that with any actor, I think. Or oh, a lot of them. They just have accents, the way of, way of speaking. And you can pick out certain things which sound a little bit different from average and assemble uh, a montage. I mean, it's not surprising that he gets cast in roles where he says, wow, it's <laughs> yeah. Owen Wilson. 
you cast people based on how they look and act. It's weird to me when people complain that so and so always plays the same part. I think, well, they're really good at that part. Wouldn't you want to do something you're good at? Yeah, it's also good when people play stuff that is out of their comfort zone and do it well. Yeah, or uh, against type, where they can do it well, but no one ever wants to take the chance with them. Do you have some words of wisdom? I don't know what wisdom you could glean from this, but I have some words. I have no interest in speaking to you or in listening to your witless prattle, so stay out of my way or you'll regret the day you ever met me. Yeah, Odo is letting it slip a little bit. He's got a bit of a temper on him. It was a little weird because we've seen the day he met Odo. Yeah, we have. So that bit stuck out to me and kind of lessened. But it, it distracted me because then I started thinking, oh, we know that day. What if Cork did forget or regret that day? It's kind of a weird idiom. You'll regret the day you ever met me. But if that day never happened... The day after would have been really weird. <laughs> Who is that guy? No one's introduced me. Why is this guy in my life? Sitting thinking, I remember Why am the I... day before yesterday he wasn't here. <laughs> drawing a blank on what happened yesterday, but now he's here. I'm inexplicably drawn to him. Oh. Maybe one day we'll share bunk beds. They don't need to. He, he buckets. Share bunk beds. Buckets. <laughs> uh, Quark could have uh, got up to so much hijinks. That's probably why Odo went full on rage because he didn't want Quark weeing in the bucket. <laughs> he wanted to make it very clear that if Quark did anything, he would die. He should know that already, though. Yeah, Quark is a smart cookie. In fact, he's the smartest one of the lot because he bailed before everyone started getting mauled by the Jem'Hadar. Oh, there was another thing I had some mad speculation about. Go for it. So when we first see the Nagus staff in this episode, I was really hoping it was a counterfeit one. Oh, and, yeah. And that Cisco just made it to manipulate Quark, and then it would reveal Cisco as a crazy person. He's a great manipulator. Yeah, Quark walks out, and then Cisco just goes and puts it back in the replicator and goes, "Yeah, okay, unreplicate." <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Armin Shimmerman was unhappy with that scene. Oh, why? Uh, he thought it was overly manipulative and. Uh, Nasty on Cisco's behalf to make him kiss the staff of the Nagus. That made me uncomfortable. I think it was played for laughs, but it comes across as a bit culturally insensitive. I mean, considering how the last episode of season two was digging into Cisco for his appalling attitude to the Ferengi, and now he's just almost mocking Quarks. Yeah, if uh, they had more distance culture. from that, maybe it wouldn't be so bad, but coming on the heels of that episode, it's really bad. I think they could have fixed it if Quark had been the instigator. How so? Well, Quark's gonna leave and then Cisco's like, uh, 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 aren't you forgetting something? Kiss this, kiss my rod. <laughs> if uh, Quark had been the one to be like, uh, sorry, I, I have to kiss that. <laughs> Cisco's like, uh, okay. Oh, that would be really funny. Yeah, then it would come off more humorous and culturally appropriate. And might have yeah. actually showed Cisco learning a little bit about the friendly rather than just hating on them. Because, yeah, you got your comedic awkward moment of Cisco being like, oh god, he's kissing something that I'm holding. <laughs> yeah. It could have worked, even if he just gives it a nice little peck. The same, same uh, idea, just slightly different dialogue, and I think it could have helped it a lot. Yeah, the, the framing would make a huge difference. 
Oh well, I'm sure it won't matter as soon as everyone's dead now, apart from Quark, who's going to now be in charge of Deep Space Nine, being the only one that wasn't murdered by the Jim Hadar. He'd do a pretty good job. He's done it in the past, and he did a good job. Anyway, I'm tired of your uh, pr- prattle. So witless prattle. Witless prattle. Um, please get out of my way so we can regret the day we ever watch the next episode. I'm not sure I know what you're saying. It's the end. Okay, that's much more clear. <laughs>